Um, okay, just a moment. Um, okay, so here are two examples to show the applications of deep learning in complex tasks. Uh, the first example is the instance segmentation. That's to say, given give you uh, given an input image, um, this work uh, or instance segmentation uh, can like segments um, persons or people in this image, and then do the post estimation uh, of each person within this image. Uh, so this is actually the instance segmentation for the humans. Uh, it can also be applied to other objects. Yeah. So this is a uh, the first example that uh, the deep learning can be applied to uh, deal with or handle the complex tech tasks. Um, another example is the AlphaGo, which is a very, very like uh, well-known or popular or famous like works a few years ago. Yeah, actually in AlphaGo, there are two networks like policy networks uh, and value networks. Yeah, so these two networks both apply the deep learning technique or models to encode um, the goal, uh, the goal game, yeah, to uh, to decide where the next move is, and or to decide uh, the value of the move for the current states, yeah. And um, another two examples uh, that uh, the deep learning can be applied or has been applied to is um, human body reconstruction. So given given a color image, uh, given a color image which has a person in it. Um, deep learning can be applied to reconstruct the human body uh, or three D human body, uh, which contains uh, the detailed close uh, normal and some like um, details of the person's uh, avatar like that. Um, another example is the neural machine translation, which is uh, actually uh, also a very like a uh, well known or like famous examples that's used the deep learning to do the uh, translation. Uh, you can see that's given a sentence, which is in Chinese. Uh, we can use the deep learning techniques to encode this uh, Chinese sentence, and then using the decoder to translate the meaning of this sentence into um, English words or English sentence. Yeah, so these are two examples that uh, deep learning can be used um, in different kinds of tasks. Okay, so uh, in summary, like uh, deep learning includes three, uh, meaning includes three types of models. Um, Multi-layer perceptron, uh, which is used to process the low dimensional data, for example, the signal data. Uh, the second type is uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, which is used to process the high dimensional data, for example, the images. Um, the third, uh, the third category or the third type of the models is um, the recurrent neural network, uh, which is used to uh, process the sequential data. For example, the text, uh, the time series data. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, especially for those data whose order, like wh whose order, is very important to decode. Yeah. So this is the uh, recurrent neural network uh, focuses on. Yeah, here, are, uh, and I also show like three examples to these three kinds of data. Okay, then uh, we are just to give some like intuitive description uh, to, to describe uh, what these three models are or how they works for different types of data. Yeah, so this is the multi-layer perception. So the input is actually um, a low dimensional data, and you can regard it as a one dimensional vector with four variables. Yeah. So after going through multiple layers of perceptions, which contains the linear layer and nonlinear layers, and the outputs uh, could be the like the probability of the uh, the probability of categories the input of the input samples belongs to, for example, class. Uh, like category one and category two and category three. So for in, the, in this example, like your prediction, like uh, will have the highest probability for the category two, right? Because it, it has a darker um, color here. Yeah, so this is the multi-layer perceptron. 
to process the um, low dimensional data. And um, another example, oh, sorry, and, uh, another model is the convolution neural networks. So the left figure shows the um, working mechanism of the convolution neural networks. So you can regard the input of the of the of the patches or of the squares in blue as the input images. Yeah, and the moving three by three patches can be regarded as the filters or parameters or weights in the convolution ne neural networks. Uh, it's moving uh, through the input images to extract features. And, and these features are shown in green here. Yeah, so this is the one layer of convolutional neural networks to uh, do the representation learning of high dimensional data, uh, for example, images. Yeah, so the right figure shows a pipeline or examples um, how multiple layers of convolutional neural networks uh, to encode the input images to do the classification. So the input is a uh, image of a cat. Yeah, and it will be fed into the convolutional networks with multiple layers. And after we have the final layers of extracted features, we can use it to uh, predict whether this image is a, is a cat or not. Yeah, it's a binary classification, right? Yeah. So. This is the convolutional neural networks to encode or to process the high dimensional data. Um, the third type of um, deep learning models is uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, actually, it, uh, usually it, ha it has two normally used uh, types of our model, a gated recurrent units, GRU model, a long short term memory, LSTM model. Um, due to the time limits, we will not introduce details of these two models. Uh, but just to let you know that uh, uh, GRU or LSTM both belongs to the re recurrent neural networks. So uh, the left figure shows an intuitive um, explanation of how our model works. Yeah, because our model focuses on the time series or sequential data, right? For example, your input will be uh, what time is it? Uh, question mark. Uh, five five steps, right? And the order within this sentence is very important for for this uh, uh for this like a text or sequential data. Yeah. So the uh the circle here shows the hidden state of the uh, RN model, uh, which can encode the temporal information or the order information, uh, within the input. And you can see that the color within the RN model updates after each time step we fit into uh, the data or we fit into the sample. Like what time is it question mark, right? Yeah, so so this kind of uh, model can encode like the very important like uh, temporal information or the order information, uh, which, uh, which can be used to uh, deal with many uh, sequential tasks like the neural machine translation I mentioned just now. Right? Right. So the encoder will decode this sentence in Chinese. And after that, you, it will use the decoder to generate or to translate another sentence, uh, which, which has the order uh, in English, right, the sentence. Yeah, so this is the recurrent neural network. Okay, for now, we uh, have introduced uh, the basics of deep learning and uh, the three most commonly use the uh, deep learning models. And um, next part, we will go, uh, we will quickly go through the human pose and shape representation, uh, which will be used in the following two sections that uh, we will uh, talk about later. Yeah, so for the human pose and shape representation, um, the most, sim uh, sorry, the simplest one is the articulate skeleton representation. Uh, you can see the skeleton based uh, representation as an example on the right. In the image here, yeah, and um, another one is the parametric shape presentation, uh, which is a triangular mesh with more than six thousand vertices, uh, given eighty-two parameters. Yeah, so uh, you you can see an example here, like the input is a color image. Uh, sorry, uh, you can see the like you can see the blue or the pink, like pink shapes here. Uh, yeah, which is actually a triangular mesh. Uh, with more than like 6,000 vertices. 
which is controlled, which is controlled or determined by only 82 parameters. Uh, but um, the benefits of this kind of representation is that uh, it looks better than the articulate skeleton representation mentioned mentioned previously, right? Yeah, and uh, the disadvantages or the drawbacks of this representation is that um, it is naked body. Yeah, it it doesn't have any clothes or texture. Uh, just looks ugly, actually. Yeah, but uh, but to be honest, like it's it's a little, it's a, at least it's better than the than the first point that representation articulate right. Yeah. Okay, and the third and the third uh, representation is the volumetric shape representation. That's to say, you will like uh, represents the shape in the three D volumes. Uh, actually, this is not the focus in our today's talk so we will not uh, mention too much about this okay so uh now we introduce like three commonly used uh, human pose and shape presentation um in literature and then we will go to go to the um second section uh human pose and shape estimation from novel cameras okay so uh, as you may know, that uh, traditional RGB camera is widely used in our daily life, right? So there are many previous works that focusing on the human pose and shape estimation from traditional cameras. Um, here we will list the two examples. Uh, the first example is open pose, uh, which estimates the multi-person 2D pose estimation from color images. Yeah, you can see the demo shown here. Um, another example is the HMR, which, uh, which estimates the uh, human parametric shape uh, from the input color images. For, uh, you can see the like, like, like a blue body shape here and also the pink body shape here. Yeah. So this is the uh, human shape estimation from the RGB color, sorry, RGB camera or color images. Yeah, so our first work, or not like the previous work, um, our recent work focuses on the human pose estimation from polarization camera or the event camera, because this because those uh, novel cameras has uh, have their unique advantages over the RGB cameras. So so that's the reason why we would like to explore some like um, ex uh, explore some like. Uh, some methods or some results that using the novel cameras to do the human pose and shape estimation. Yeah. Uh, so for the polarization camera, yeah, polarization camera is um, it's built upon the reflected lights. Uh, sorry, it's built upon the physics law um, that is reflected lights is polarized. Yeah, actually, th uh, this is learned from the high school, I, I think. Yeah, so reflect light is polarized. Uh, you can see an example here. Uh, the incident light project to the surface normal of an object here, and it has the reflected light, right? So the reflected light includes three components, uh, polarized specular reflection, uh, unpolarized diffusion, uh, sorry, diffuse refra refraction, uh, polarized diffuse reflection. Um, as for the human body, um, we have the clothes or we have the skin, yeah. So the last two components will be the dominant parts of the reflected light. So it will be, so the reflected light from human body will mainly consist of uh, unpolarized diffuse reflection and the polarized diffuse fraction. Yeah. And um, because this reflected light uh, contains the, contains like the geometric cues of the surface normal of this object, right? Yeah. So the polarization degree depends on the surface normal for the uh, polarized diffuse refraction light components. Yeah. So based on this assumption, um, we can use the polarization camera to estimate the surface normal uh, of the human body. Yeah. And the, and this figure and the figure in the right shows the how polarization camera captured this kind of polarization information. Yeah. Uh, you can see that um, this is the input lights and the reflected lights. Yeah. Um, 
when when we use different degrees of the polarizer on the top of the camera, uh, we can capture or we can sample, uh, we can sample several dots, or uh, we can sample several points on this sine curve. Yeah, on this sine curve, and based on the several sampled points on the sine curve, we can calculate. Um, we can calculate um, the polarization degree, uh, which is which is actually uh, regarded as the surface normal of this project uh, of this object um, on this point. Yeah. So this is the uh, brief introduction of the uh, working mechanism of polarization camera. Yeah. So so this uh, physical laws uh, motivates us to use the polarization camera that can capture the polarization of refracted lights that preserves rich geometric cues of an object surface. Yeah, and uh, in our recent work, we propose a, a, a method or a pipeline to uh, estimate human pose and shape from the polarization image as shown here. So the input is actually a, a polarization image and it has three components. Uh, the first component is polar to normal, which estimate or predict the, the surface normal of this person from the polarization image. And then polar to shape to estimate the parametric shape of the person in the image. Uh, yeah, so we can see that it is a naked body, right? Without any like closing details or surface details. Yeah, and the last step is to deform, deform the naked body using the predicted normal and get the closed body shape. Um, as in, as is shown here. Yeah, so so for the first component, um, polar to normal, like uh, we can calculate the ambiguous normal using the uh, physics laws. Yeah, uh, it has the ambiguous normal uh, because of the because of the like the ambiguous uh, directions of the of the ref, uh, of the reflected angle or the polarization angle. Yeah. Um, it has some like uh, encoder decoder to first uh, classify each pixels into different categories backgrounds, uh, normal one, uh, normal two, and the coarse normal of the person's surface. Yeah. And after calculate the normal residual, we will use it to refine the coarse normal to finally get the predicted normal, uh, predicted surface normal of this person in the image. Yeah. Um, and you can see that all this encoder decoder uh, consists of, uh, are actually like CNN models uh, with multiple layers to extract the representation or to learn the representation of normal informations from the polarization image. And the polar to shape that takes the polarization image and also the predicted normal as the input to predict the um, par parametric shape, which has 82 parameters, right? Um, after that, we'll deform this naked body to um, to make to to like um, to uh, put this uh, surface details or closing details on this um, person uh, person body to, and finally we can get the closed body shape. Yeah. Um, here we show some examples uh, of our results and uh, five previous works. Yeah. Uh, these five pre previous works all are based on the uh, color images. And our method, method is based on the polarization image. And we can see that our method can estimate um, accurate pose, right? You can see the hand hair. Um, the hand hair is not correct actually for, for these two methods. And also we, our method can um, construct or can uh, put like more like accurate details uh, closing details on, on the like the surface, sorry, on the body shape, right? Like compare with some like previous works. Yeah. So this is the like a uh, visual results of our uh, human pose and shape estimation from polarization camera. And here we show some like uh, more visual results uh, as in GIF to to illustrate the results or to illustrate the effectiveness, effectiveness of polarization cameras for the human pose and shape estimation.
Okay, so um, this is the, uh, so for now, this is the uh, one of our recent work for the polarization camera. Then we'll go to the human pose estimation from event camera. Yeah, so what is the event camera or what's the unique uh, differences or advantages of the event camera? Well, uh, for the standard camera, like the RGB or polarization camera, it is actually uh, outputs four image frames at fixed frame rates. Yeah, but for the event camera, um, it will output independent and asynchronized events, X, Y, P, T. Well, X, Y means the pixel or coordinates, P means the uh, binary uh, brightness change, uh, which is positive one or negative one, and T is the timestamp. Yeah. So um, I placed the video here to show a more um, vivid uh, examples to illustrate the difference between stand camera and event camera. Okay, you can you can see that um, the black dot is rotating around this cone. Yeah. And you can see that for the stand camera, it will output the full frame at fixed frame rates, right? You can see the time axis. Um, but for the event camera, it will only output the events for the pixel whose brightness change is greater than a threshold. Yeah, for example, for, for the red dots here, uh, if it moves, 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 um, down, moves down, then the pixel here will generate some events, right? Because some of the events has the brightness change from black to gray or from gray to black. So you can see the events generated here uh, at this moment. Yeah, so yeah. And you can see that when the black dot does not move, you can see that the event camera does not generate any events or there is no events generated by the events camera because there is not, nothing is moving within this camera, right? Yeah. So this is another like a uh, very important difference between the event camera and the standard camera. Okay, and uh, the third one, Yeah, uh, you can see the third one. When the black dot is moving very, very, very fast, you can see that the standard camera will have the motion blur because, uh, because the shuttering time or within the shuttering time of the camera, the black dots will move, uh, will, will be moving too much, right? Yeah, so that's the reason why standard camera can have the motion blur of these black dots. Yeah, but uh, event camera does not have such kind of issues because it has very high temporal uh, temporal um, re resolution, yeah. Uh, as in shown here, uh, it has many like uh, rings. You can you can you can see here like circles or rings here uh, through through the time. Yeah. So okay. So in summary, like event camera has its unique advantages compared with the RGB camera. Yeah, it has high temporal resolution, very, very high frequency of the clock, right? Um, the second is uh, low latency. So uh, even camera will typically no, have no motion blur. So it will not have like such uh, motion blur of the human like motions or human pose in the image, right? And then a uh, third example, uh, so, sorry, third advantage is the low power uh, because it only outputs the events, not the full frame of images, yeah. And the third one is the high, dyna high dynamic range. That's to say it can um, acquire data from moonlight to the daylight. Yeah, so uh, a straightforward question about event camera that's um, how about using it for the human pose estimation? Yeah, so, so this is the work that uh, we have, or this is our recent work that's used the uh, event camera for the human pose estimation. Uh, so the input is actually the event stream captured by the event camera as I uh, as I shown here. Yeah, our first step will infer the optical flow from an event stream um, as shown here. And um, the arrow here shows the uh, shows the direction of each pixels or 
or the flow of each pixels uh, estimated or inferred from the event stream. And the uh, stage two will estimate 3D human shape variations from events and optical flow. Yeah, so that's to say we have we need this first frame of grayscale image, and we have the and we have the corresponding corresponding beginning pose and shape. Yeah, and it is known or extracted from the first frame of grayscale image, and we have the shape variations. For example, from zero t t zero to t one, we can construct or we can articulate the human body to get the human pose estimation uh, for the for the time T1, right? And for the time T2, T3, and T4. Yeah. So uh, this is the pipeline of our method. Uh, so given an event stream, we first converted it, convert it to the events frames and then fed into the flow net to predict the optical flow. So the flow, flow net is actually a kind of CNN model yeah, to predict the optical flow. Um, and after that, given the events frame and also the optical flow, we use the CNN model and also the IM model to predict the pulse variations through the time. You can see that uh, the, uh, the delta theta T1 means the pulse variations from T0 to T1, and delta zero T and delta theta T2 means the uh, shape or pulse variations from T0, uh, sorry, T1 to T2, right? And after that, we can get the Human pulse estimation at each t um, uh, at each time point. Yeah, so this is the overall uh, method of our uh, work for the human pulse estimation from events camera. Yeah, and uh, this short video shows some um, estimated pose and shapes from the event stream uh, as the input. Uh, yeah, as uh, yeah, as it's showing here. Yeah, this is the optical flow inferred from this event stream. And this is the estimated shape, uh, alternative view one and alternative view two. Okay, yeah. Uh, we also compare our work with some previous works or, yeah. So the first column, yeah, sorry. Um, the first column, um, is the HMR or VIB, which is the method to estimate the pose from the RGB images. Yeah, and uh, the uh, middle column uh, is uh, the most recent work, event cap, that estimates the uh, human pose or human pose and shape through the time using the events and sequential grayscale image. Yeah, but our work only requires the uh, events and first frame of grayscale image. And we can see that even we do not require the sequential grayscale image, we can still estimate um, accurate pulse of the persons in uh, through the time. Yeah, so this this, gray, this grayscale image shown here is just for reference. Yeah, it will not use as the input except for the first frame. And here is another example. Uh, to show the results of our work. Okay. Yeah. So for now, this is the. Um, this is the. Uh, this is all of the second section, that we'll talk about human pose and shape estimation for novel cameras, and then we'll go to the motion generation from, um, from given action category or given text description. Yeah. So for the motion generation from given action category, um, uh, this pipeline shows the overall working flow, yeah, of our recent work. Yeah, so given the action um, category, like working, jumping, or running, yeah, first they will be put into the uh, motion generator. Uh, this will, uh, we'll talk about this part later. And the motion generator will generate multiple different uh, sequences of 3D poses, and we call it uh, 3D motions. Yeah, like work one, work two, work one, which means that different or diverse motions, and all these motions conform to the given action category, for example, uh, work. Yeah, and you can see that this kind of like motions uh, articulate skeletons, which looks very ugly, right? Yeah, so the input image, so we, 
we attempt to generate uh, the videos from this generated 3D motions by taking the input images, by taking a color images of person as the input and um, extract 3D pose and shape and then do the rigging animation and rendering to get the avatar of this person and then uh, animates and rendering the according to the generated 3D motions, 3D motions. And finally, we can get uh, the corresponding uh, generative videos that describes the given, cat uh, the, the given action category. Like for example, this corresponds to um, work one. Yeah, this corresponds to work two, this corresponds to work n. Yeah. So this is the overall pipeline that we can do the motion generation from a uh, given uh, action category. Yeah. So as for the details of motion generator, well, um, uh, we should we just briefly introduce the uh, the overall like uh, pipeline that how the model generates the motions. Uh, like, uh, okay, so at time t, at time step t, we have the previous pose, right? P t minus one, and we have the given action type a, and we have the time counter c t. Yeah, and first we will use the encoder and the GRU model to GRU is a um, is an ion model, right? To generate the prior distribution um, of the of the pose for time t equals to two. Uh, sorry, for time t, right? And given this sampled sampled vector or sampled representation z t, uh, we can use the encoder GRU and decoder to uh, estimate or to predict or to generate um, the pose at time t. Yeah. So. So at this at this point we get the generated motion or generated 3D pose at time t, right? Then at time t equals to one, uh, sorry, at time t plus one, we can use uh, we can use pt, which is the pose at time t, um, as the input here, and then go through this pipeline to generate uh, the pose at time t plus one, right? Okay. Yeah, so this is the motion generator with um, our model. Yeah, uh, so in this slide, we will show some um, examples um, of the, show some examples of our generated motion. Um, before I play this video, like uh, there are three uh, real motions mixed with our generated motions. Yeah, so, so in total, um, there are eight, there are eight motions and three of them are real and five of them are generated motions. Yeah, and you can try to discriminate like which one is real, which one is generated one. Yeah, you can see that this three one, uh, this three, um, this three ones are gener uh, a real one and others are generated one. And you can, you can see that our gener generated motions are quite natural and also diverse, right? Because uh, the other, uh, the five generated motions are actually have different patterns, and uh, yeah, and all these five uh, generated motions are all confirmed to the like for example here uh, jump up action right, but they have different patterns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in this slide, we'll show more results with different actions and the diverse images. Um, you can see here, uh, we have uh, we have one, two, three. Uh, we have nine color images with different persons or different <coughs> uh, persons in the image, right? Yeah, and we can show diverse like different persons for different poses, like warm up, uh, work, boxing, uh, throw, sit down, jump up, like that. And uh, this person or this avatar can um, do such kind of a given action uh, accordingly, yeah. Okay, yeah, for now, we mainly introduce the motion generation from given action category. And um, our most recent work um, is that uh, we can also do the motion generation from given text description, yeah. So what does it mean? Uh, here is some very like uh, straightforward example. Uh, so given a text description, 
uh, the figure uh, rises from a lying position and works in a counterclockwise circle and then lays back down to the ground. Yeah, so this is the text description, right? Yeah, um, and we have three motions here. Okay, the right one is the real one. Oh, sorry, the right one is the real motion. Yeah, we can see uh, it's confirmed to, it conforms to the text description above, right? Yeah, and uh, you can find, you can also find that the two generated motions, generated motion one, generated motion two, they have different patterns, right? But they all describe this sentence mentioned above, right? They have different poses or different patterns, but they all conform to the test description here, like rising from a lying position, like here, here, and work and works in a counterclockwise, right? Here and here. And then lays back and then lays back down the ground, right? And the and the last two last three steps. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see that these three motions are, are quite like natural, and they all conform to the text text description um here. So so how can we achieve this? Uh yeah, I'll just give a brief um introduction uh, of the pipeline. That's how we generate this um motion from the given text description. Well, as an example, like a person slowly worked forward and returned backwards. Yeah, like here. So the input is actually a sentence like, like this. Yeah, it will first like go to the text to length to sample the motion length because some motions has, uh, has a, a longer time steps and some motions have a shorter time steps, right? So we will just sample the motion length here. Uh, and then this sentence will go through a text the encoder to encode the words uh, within the sentence and then go through the GRU model to encode, to encode the language features using the GRU model. Yeah, and this motion prior distribution shown here, which is the output of GRU model will be sampled as the, and the sampled data will be the input to another GRU model. Yeah, and this GRU model will works to uh, encode the temporal data or the encode the temporal 3D poses through the time to generate the motion snippet codes from time t to, from, from time, uh, t equals to one to t equals to capital T, right? And this motion snippet codes will be used as the input to the decoder, which is uh, the MLP models to, uh, to reconstruct or to decode uh, the motion that we'll, we will generate here. Yeah, so here, here gives two examples. Yeah, um, one is generated motion and uh, the, other one, the other one is the real motion, like, like, the, uh, like the output of here. Yeah, and you can see the two motions like, like this, oh, sorry. Yeah, and you can see that these two sequences or these two motions um, both describes a person slowly worked forward and the return backwards, right? Yeah, uh, the answer is that the left one is the real one. Sorry, the left one is the generated one. The right one is the real one. Yeah, uh, I think if, if I didn't tell you that it's hard to discriminate which one is generated, which one is real, right? Yeah, oh, okay. So um, this is another example of, uh, of the results from our work uh, text description is a person picks up something, sorry, a person picks something up with both hands, moves it to the side and then places it back down. Yeah. And we have two generated motions and one real motions. Yeah, and you can see that um, they are they are similar to the like to the real motion, but actually they have different like patterns or poses or poses, right? 
And um, one more example. Yeah, one more example is that uh, the text description is the figure rises from a lying position and works in a counterclockwise before laying down, laying back down flat on their back. Yeah, you you may you may figure out that this is a quite complex description or this is quite complex case, right? Uh, the person will need to like uh, uh, rise from lying position and works in a counterclockwise and then laying back down flat on their back, right? So the first one is the generator motion. Yeah, and the second one is generator motion and the real motion. Yeah, and you can see that um, uh, both two generator motions conform to the text description, but they have different patterns or they are different 3D poses or they are different motions, right? Yeah, so this is the reason why we call it diverse human pose as uh, sorry, human motion generation. Yeah, so because uh, if you every time you generate very similar motions, then um, this task or this work is not uh, like interesting, right? Yeah, so, so in this example, like we show a very complex case like a person will do many like complex like like motions or actions uh, within the text description, and we can find that our generative motions are quite like uh, natural. Yeah. Okay, so this is the motion generation from given text description. Um, yeah. So to summary, like human pose estimation and motion generation using deep learning, uh, we talked about three main sections. Uh, in this talk, first the main session is the basics uh, of deep learning and human pose and shape estimation. Yeah, and the second section is about uh, human pose and shape estimation for novel cameras using CNN models. Yeah, um, like the polarization camera and uh, the event camera. Yeah, and the third section is about diverse human motion generation uh, using other models uh, from the action category or from the text description. Yeah, so this is the um, overall like a uh, summary of this talk. And uh, thanks for listening. And uh, if you are interested in our work or have uh, some any questions, uh, you can refer to our papers and you can also directly contact me through the email, um, seou2 at alberta.ca. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Su Hao, for uh, like giving this talk, and uh, it's a uh, really great talking, giving like uh, people like a uh, uh, good understanding of the uh, uh, the the topic. So I have a few uh, uh, questions. Like uh, you mentioned about uh, in the section one, uh, like in the in one model, it's using like eighty two parameters. So what's that eighty two parameter? It's uh, uh, it's about like when you using uh, uh, it's kind of for uh, forum based or oh, okay you mean here right uh, yes yes in okay. like uh, parametric uh, ship uh, like estimation uh, representation like 82 uh, parameter what's that 82 parameter controls Okay, yeah, uh, these 80 parameters uh, consist of like uh, the pose of this person, which is uh, uh, 72 parameters to control the overall skeleton of the person. Yeah, and okay. another 10 parameters uh, controls the weights and like the body, like the height, the weights, or oh. some other okay. like, components of, the, of this person, yeah. So, so overall it has 82 parameters. Yeah. yeah, the 72 is kind of the key point of the, the person. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. And and uh, you mentioned about uh, like uh, the polarized camera like that's it's quite promising like you'll be able to sensor the like the normal of the surface. I'm wondering like uh, like is that the camera it's uh, uh, is still very expensive right now like uh, the polarized camera Okay, Do you know yeah. like uh, what's the price like this kind of camera? Okay, yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, the the price for the camera I'm using for this project is two thousand USD. 
uh, United States dollar, uh, 2000 United States dollar. I'm not sure like it's, it's very expensive or it's not expensive, but for the lab use, I guess uh, uh, it's, it's, it's fine. Like 2000 USD. Yeah, dollars. if it's using like uh, in the studio or in professional, uh, like for professional people, it's okay. But for uh, like a regular people, consumer maybe a little bit high. Not like the normal camera is very cheap now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know the event camera it's much more expensive. Probably it's, uh, like twenty thousand something. Um, Do you know like uh, event camera? When I checked uh, last time, like last year, it's uh, I think. Uh, I'm not sure whether I remember correctly. It's about like, do you know the event, uh, like event camera, what's the price like? Okay. Um, yeah. So for this camera uh, I'm using in this project, uh, it takes about uh, 3,000 USD. Oh, yeah. 3,000 USD. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. And there are also like some cheaper like choices, like with lower resolution. Yeah. Oh. It, will be, it will be much cheaper than, than 3,000. Yeah. Okay, okay. But uh, I, I think uh, this kind of camera, it's like in early stage right now and eventually will become cheaper and cheaper also if more and more people are using it. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Like uh, things are go always go from the lab to the commercial uses, right? Okay. And uh, for the event camera, like uh, one quite obvious question, it's uh, if there's no motion happened, then the the camera will will have no any like signal from it. Uh, will it be a problem like uh, when people are st uh, standing, there's no no motion happens, then there's no signal from the camera? Uh, yes, you're right. Like uh, event camera will have such kind of like drawbacks or such kind of disadvantage. Yeah. So so uh, this is reason that uh, for a long time that's after the, the person like moves a little bit, then it can capture some like uh, information of the human pose like through a long time. Like we cannot, we cannot assume that the person is always uh, unmoved there. Yeah, yeah. otherwise you, you don't have to do anything about that, right? <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. So when the, when the person is moving, then the event camera can capture the motions of this person. Yeah, so if, if uh, at the first stage, like for, for example, uh, the first stage from T0 to T2 here, it, the person does not move. We can still have use the first frame of grayscale image to have its uh, initial pose or initial shape to, oh, okay. to do the estimation. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, just the initial stage maybe uh, uh, need some assistance from the RGB camera. And after that, then without RGB camera, it's okay as well, because if there's no event happened, that means there's no, no like no motion happened and we are just uh, continuously using the, the last uh, model. Yeah, you are right, you are right. Okay. And uh, for the motion uh, generation part, like uh, how that is related to like uh, the typical uh, GAN kind of approach, like for GAN kind of approach, we be able to like uh, generate uh, some kind of synthetic uh, motion as well. So how let uh, your work uh, compare with the uh, like uh, gang kind of generation? Okay. Um, yeah, the main difference is that uh, GAN will generate images as the final output. Yeah, it means that it will generate maybe the background and also the, the texture of the persons as an image. Yeah, and our work generates the 3D motions representation which is the 3D poses through the time. Yeah, not the image, not the whole image. Yeah. Okay. And after and that, uh, yeah, and sorry. And after that, if you have a person avatars and then you can generate any like uh, videos that you want for any person that you have. Okay. And uh, so it seems to me like uh, we can using the, the gang approach for the like the stage you are just mentioning about, like just using gang to generate uh, the motion itself, just merely the motion itself as well. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, we have some comparison in the papers to compare the gang methods to generate videos and our uh, pipeline to generate videos. Yeah, and we found that our, our pipeline is more robust 
to generate like a uh, natural uh, video or general natural images compared with the GAN because because GAN GAN is not very stable actually in some cases. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And for the motion generation uh, work, uh, like in the data set, uh, like in the data set, what kind of information is encoded in the data set? Uh, I mean, like uh, okay. when you're training the model, like uh, you need uh, like certain motion information and also certain like uh, probably RGB information or certain information. What okay. kind of information it's uh, it's used as an input? Okay. Uh, yeah. So the information we need is just uh, the 3D pose. Like uh, sorry, uh, the motions con including sorry. Uh, the information we need is the poses through the time, like 3D poses through the time. Yeah, like, and the different oh, motion so will have different like action label. For, oh, for, like, okay, for this so one. it's yeah. kind of a key point, uh, kind of the like, different position of the, like, yeah, from yeah. the key point and using that as, uh, as the input. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, and you label it uh, to that. Okay, yeah, I got, I, I, understand it exactly now. And for the, like from the text, uh, for the, from the text and uh, be able to mapping the, the text to uh, like how you like bridge the gap from the text, like the natural language to the, uh, to the motion kind of for like each step of. For... Okay, yeah, I got, I got the question. Uh, yeah, basically like, um, we will use like this kind of um, representation, like motion snippet codes. Yeah. So in the first stage, it will encode the text or language information using the GRU model. Yeah. And this GRU model will encode text information and then generate the motion snippet codes. Yeah. So this motion snippet codes will be supervised during the training, or will be supervised in art in some um, in some like traditional. Uh, ways to 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 get the motion snippet codes, and this motion snippet codes will be used to in the decoder to uh, obtain the the actual uh, output of the motion through the uh, through the time. Yeah. yeah so basically, the, the the key points is here is the motion snippet codes oh. representation. Yeah. So yeah, so again, for regarding the training data point of view, like the training data, it have for like uh, the key points, like uh, and uh, the key point movement, uh, in, like different uh, at different time point, the like, key point uh, yeah. at different location. Yeah. And along with that, uh, it will have for, it will have for like uh, the text associated at the different time point. Um. Well, um, the annotation is that you have a sequence of 3D poses, which is a motion, right? And yeah. we have just a one text description for this motion, not for, oh, for the whole concept, motion. Yeah. So it's kind of, you have the whole sentence for the, like uh, for quite long kind of period of time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, then that will be much more challenging, like uh, because uh, need, uh, also you need to be able to like, uh, because the important thing probably is only the keywords, right? The, a lot of uh, other words may be less important. And uh, the network will be able to learn by itself, like uh, what's the key point it is, the, the keywords, I mean. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So you need to uh, you need to fill in the gap between the language and also the motion or the pose. There are two different domains. So it will be much more like uh, complex than the, than the previous one, like generate from action category. Yeah. Okay. And uh, all these things can be training from end to end through the, the one network? Or... Uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. So for brief introduction, we I, don't, I didn't include the training process or training method mm -hmm. in, in the slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. All these models are trained end to end or can be trained end to end. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I probably will reading your whole paper and see to understand the, the detail. I think this is quite impressive, like uh, be able to just the whole se the whole sequence of motion and just one like uh, kind of sentence and be able to uh, training from to end, end to end.
Okay. Uh, I think uh, let's uh, uh, let's all my question uh, have for right now. And uh, do you have some like uh, final words to share, like uh, uh, based on like your research on this topic, like uh, what's the future will looks like, how this uh, technology can apply to like our uh, real life, how this uh, like uh, research can like used in different applications. Okay. Um, well, like for the like for the motion generation. Uh, it can be widely used in the VR or AR technology, like in the in that industrial, because you can generate like digital human. Uh, sorry, you can like animate uh, digital humans for different actions or motions like that. Yeah, and um, as for the human pose and pose estimation from novel cameras, um, I think uh, it has some previous work. They're using the event camera on the auto, uh, on the auto autonomous driving. Yeah, in the autonomous driving, that's use the event camera to capture some data um, that is unique compared with the RGB, the RGB camera. Yeah, so actually event camera is applied in more and more uh, application scenarios. Yeah, so, uh, so I, get, I think in the future, like event camera or polarization camera will be, uh, will be more and more widely used in different tasks. And uh, as for the work in, in my like research area, I think uh, so. I just explore those potential in the human posing shape estimation, and maybe in the future they can be applied to to this kind of tasks in other uh, applications like autonomous driving uh, or the or the uh, video surveillance like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sihao, and. Uh, Thank you for taking time uh, to giving us uh, uh, this talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone for attending today's event and uh, we will see you on our next month's event. Bye-bye. Yeah,